please open to Mark, the first gospel, chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. I think you're going to enjoy this story today, and I hope it touches you in a new way. Um, Mark, chapter 4, verse 35. An amazing event really happened, true story, in the life of our Lord on the earth. It says... On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Jesus said that. Now when they had left the multitude, or the crowd, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling the boat. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, Thanksgiving's coming up, and next week I'll be preaching on Thanksgiving, in case any of you are wondering. I always kind of move it to after the Thanksgiving holiday and, and make that week about Thanksgiving. This week we're, we're talking about dependence on Jesus instead of dependence on the world. It affects us all. We all have to deal with this issue. By dependency, uh, I mean relying on something other than ourselves, other than the world, other than uh, our own power. We're relying on something else, something outside of ourselves, being controlled by something else. That may not sound very good. See, by our nature, I would argue that we will resist being controlled. We will resist being dependent on something else, whatever it is. Because we all want to be in control. If you think about dependence, some examples of that. Um, you know, a flower that is growing is 100% dependent on the sunlight and on water to grow. And if it doesn't get those things, it will die. It is completely dependent. Our bodies are completely dependent on oxygen, 21% in the air. And if we don't have that, we will eventually die. Very quickly, if we have no oxygen, if you've been to the high mountains in the Rockies where the barometric pressure is lower, you will soon feel the effect of having less oxygen in the air. We are completely dependent on oxygen. A boxcar in a train is completely dependent on the locomotion of the engine. If the engine stops or it gets unhooked from the train, it's not going to move. Completely dependent. That's what we're talking about. But I tell you, it's hard for us to live that way. I've never met a man who told me that he picked his own birthday, that he picked his own family, and he knew when he would come into this world. Never met a man that ever did that. We are completely dependent on God for that. And I've never met a man, unless the case of suicide, there is no way you can predict your death. So you come into this world completely independent of you, controlled by something outside of you, and you're taken out of this world completely independent of anything you can do. Yet we live in the years of our life as if we are in complete control, with really an illusion that we are in complete control of our circumstances, of our destiny. But Scripture says it's very different. Now, people in the world, that's the way they live, that they're in complete control. There is no spiritual realm to them, so they are in complete control of their world. But Scripture says that God is entirely sovereign over the events of history, over destiny, over what will ultimately happen to us. Yes, we have free will to make choices within a range of, of options, but ultimately the direction of our lives is going to go the way God has already planned that it will go. So basically, we live with either two kinds of fear, as we'll see in this story. We either live with a fear of our circumstances, of what's going to happen to us tomorrow, whether we're going to get in an accident, whether we're going to get sick, whether we're going to 
lose somebody important, whether we're going to have enough money, whatever. We can either live in fear of physical circumstances or, as we'll see in the story, we can live in the other kind of fear, the fear of the power that controls the circumstances. There's really one of two. We can either live in, control, in fear of life or we can live in fear, in awe, in, in reverence of the power that controls it all. In the story, we're going to see that power is actually more scary than worrying about the physical realm because it's so powerful. But see, Proverbs 16 says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And, and John says, he records that Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing apart from me. It's a tad scary, really, to me to start to think about this fact that we're really not in control of our lives, of what's going to happen in the next hour, in the next day, in the next year. Yes, we do have that free will to maneuver. If I want to eat, uh, you know, a hamburger or pizza, I get some choices like that. But the ultimate outcome of our lives are really under the control of God, and it's hard for us to accept. But the point is, God will take away our fears of everyday life if we depend on Him. And I want to see how that works in this story. Joni Erickson Tata is a woman, today quadriplegic, but she was raised in a very stable athletic, active family. She was involved in, in gymnastics and cheerleading and horseback riding and all kinds of sports. She, she describes her family as being particularly athletic and active. She first heard the gospel message at a church camp when she was 15 and she believed something true about that resonated with her heart that in fact she didn't measure up to God's law she wasn't living her life in the way that, that, that she believed there was a God and he expected something from her and she wasn't doing it. So she heard that Jesus could save her from that and could make, give her salvation. So she accepted that and she says for a while her Christian life was really pretty selfish. It was really selfish prayers about help me get a boyfriend, help me lose weight, I need help with this. And her life was kind of like that with God. And it went along that way for a few years and she realized that she was really kind of had a selfish relationship with God and she asked him to help her grow closer to him in a real way. And it was about a few months after that that her sister on her 18th year asked her to go swimming. She was preparing to go to college. She had all plans of where she was going to go and what she was going to do with her life. She went swimming in a lake. She dove off of the, the, the plank and hit her head, which she couldn't see with shallow water, hit her head, snapped her fourth cervical vertebrae, snapped her spinal cord in half, and was a quadriplegic, just like that. She says that she sank into an incredibly deep depression, as you might imagine, and she didn't understand how God could allow this to happen to her. She said that People brought scripture, Christian friends, to visit her in the hospital and they read Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you a hope, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and not a future. And she said, God, not to harm me? A quadriplegic? Are you kidding me? What is this about? Well, she soon came to understand that that scripture was actually written to the Israelites as they were being taken away, God's people being taken away into captivity, into slavery, and God was telling them, yes, you're being taken away into slavery, but I have plans for you not to harm you. It's, I will not harm you. I have plans to prosper you. This being done is not of me. I'm not doing this to you. Although, again, God's sovereign over it all. But he's not causing those things to happen. She told Larry King that because of the kind of dependence that she had to have in God to make it through a single day, being a quadriplegic, can't move her arms or her legs, she paints with her mouth, and she paints beautiful pictures with her mouth. She's become quite an artist. But she can't move her arms or her legs. 
She's completely in a wheelchair. She says the kind of dependence that she has had to gain on God, the kind of dependence she has on Him is such that has developed a sweet and precious union with Jesus. And she says, despite the fact that she can't move her arms and legs, that her relationship with God is sweeter and more precious than ever because she has to depend on Him completely. She says she came to understand that that scripture that says plans not to harm you isn't really talking about your physical body, it's talking about your soul. That God will never damage your soul, he'll always enrich your soul if you will allow him. He won't promise us anything about the physical. Well, she says that she has learned to find Jesus in the splashes of hell in her life, in the difficult suffering and pain, but when she finds Jesus amidst the suffering, she finds pictures of heaven. She finds splashes of heaven, she says. You see, in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, give thanks in all, give thanks in all situations. And he doesn't say, give thanks when you feel like it. Give thanks when you feel like things are going well. Give thanks when things are going your way. No, he says, in all things, give thanks. Now, that's hard to do, but if we're completely dependent on God for the outcome of our life, it becomes much easier. If we're depending on ourselves or we're seeking our own desires and not God's, that becomes much more difficult. Our dependence and trust in God should be independent of our feelings, of our circumstances, of the way things are happening. What we need, the Bible tells us, and what we'll see in this story in a minute, is a confident trust. A confident trust in God, regardless of what's happening or how it's going or what the, the rate is, that he's in control and that we can trust him. And that's what he wants from us. He wants to see that. Pat Riley is an a NBA basketball coach. You've probably heard of him. Uh, in 1987, his team at that time was the Lakers. They beat the Celtics in the NBA championship. And it, during the parade and the celebration of that victory in 87, he said to the crowd, I guarantee you next year we will win the championship again. And people were floored by his confidence, by his willingness to say he guaranteed a victory. And you know, one year later in 88, they beat the Detroit Pistons, and they won a second NBA championship. And people talked to him and said, that seems rather cocky. And he said, no, it really wasn't anything like that. He said, what it was is I had complete trust in that team. I had an utter confidence in those people, those players, that they would indeed win the championship. And see, that's the kind of bold assurance that God is asking us to have, and we're going to see He's, he's showing us in this story. That kind of bold confidence and assurance, blessed assurance, that he's in control and that we're not. When I travel, I like to stop at Starbucks or Barnes & Noble because I know that when I go in, I can connect to the Internet because I need to do some research on a sermon or look something up or if you can watch a movie, whatever, but you can connect to the Internet. Uh, I like that because I can, I can get you know, onto the internet and do what I need to do. There's a connection there. The problem is when I leave that place, as I get farther and farther away from Starbucks, that connection severs. And it no longer works anymore. My laptop can't get that connection anymore. Uh, i got to go back to get that. Why do I bring that up? Because... I feel like a lot of us live in our relationship with God in that way. We're dependent on God at times and then we get away from Him or we get into a difficult time or a struggle and we're not depending on Him. We're depending on ourselves, we're depending on others, we're depending on the world. We're away from God. We've lost that connection. The connection's not there. We have to do something to get back to it. That is not the way God designed us to be. I'm absolutely sure that he designed us to always be connected to him. It's like having a continuous internet throughout the world. We don't have to go to Starbucks to get it. We're always, our laptop is always connected to Wi-Fi. Okay, we can always have that Wi-Fi connection. 
And God is asking you today, do you have that? Do you have a connection with him all the time in every situation? Are you dependent on his power at all times? Well, in this story that we read about Jesus calming the storm on the Galilean Sea, we see a situation where human people don't know how to deal with the power in the boat with them. They don't know how to even deal with it. It completely blows them away. A little bit about this. Do you have the picture up of the boat? This is a picture of an ancient uh, boat in Galilee. This actually, the, the boat here is shown, was, was uh, discovered in uh, 1986, I believe. And it is, it is a first century boat discovered on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee. This was the actual kind of boat. It may not have been the very boat that Jesus was in, although it could have been. That is the actual boat that the fishermen used in that day to be out on this sea when this storm arose. And what you can see from it, uh, there's a picture there of, of what it would look like as well, it was about 27 feet long and 7 feet wide, uh, shorter than a school bus, and it was not very wide relative to its length. And, you know, it was made out, this boat was made out of many different kinds of wood, which tells us that either there was a wood shortage at that time, or the boat was made of scrap wood or something. But that's a typical way that that boat would look. And in this story, you had the disciples, the apostles in the boat, and Jesus asleep in that kind of a boat on the Galilean Sea. Look at the next slide, the picture of the sea. This is the Galilean Sea, and something we know about the Galilean Sea very well from meteorology is that the cool air comes over the mountains on the eastern side, and as it comes down and meets the warmer air that's rising up from the water, when that meets, it causes fierce and violent storms that are unpredictable. You never know when one of these storms is going to arise today, and back then you didn't know when they were going to arise. And so what happens is Jesus and the disciples are getting away from the crowds. They're going to the other side. They're in this Galilean Sea in a fishing boat in the first century and a violent storm erupts that they, even these fishermen who were very used to being on the water were scared. They were absolutely frightened to death that they were going to die because water was raging around this boat and water was pouring inside the boat and they look back to their master and Jesus is sound asleep. He has a pillow and he's laying there and he's totally out of it, asleep and unworried and unconcerned because he, he, he knows his father is in control. He's not worried. But it says this was a very great storm. The word that it uses, a great windstorm, it sounds like no typical storm. Uh, the Greek word is mega. So a mega storm arises and scares them nearly to death and they go back and find Jesus asleep. And, they, and that makes them even more scared. You see, the wind that was causing this was unseen. The effect they were feeling in this violent storm. They couldn't see the, the, where it was coming from. It was coming from wind. You can't see wind. But you can see the effects of when that I think sometimes the storms of our life are much like that. When we go through difficult times or, or trials or suffering or sickness or whatever it is or accidents, we don't always see the source of where it's coming from, why it happens to us. You ever hear somebody say, why me? Why does this happen to me? Why did this happen? I don't understand it. We can't see the wind, but we see the effects of the wind and the storm that we suffer, very much like they were suffering on that day. Now I tell you, we all have disappointments. We all suffer broken dreams. Uh, and that's just part of life. There's a joke about the, uh, the lady, who the, the couple, they were in bed sleeping, married couple, and the woman had this dream. And she woke up and told her husband, she said, Honey, I had a dream that you bought me a gold necklace. And he said, what? She said, I had a dream that you bought me a gold necklace. What do you think that means? He said, well, Valentine's Day is coming. Go back to sleep. You'll find out on Valentine's Day. So she goes back to sleep. A couple of nights later, she wakes up again, three in the morning, wakes up her husband and says, 
honey, I had a dream. This time you bought me a pearl necklace. He says, wait till Valentine's Day. You'll understand. Okay, so she goes back to sleep. Third time she wakes up. Honey, I had a dream. You bought me a diamond necklace. He said, yes, again, you know, let's go back to sleep. But on Valentine's Day's coming next week, you'll, be, you'll understand your dream. So they go on to the next week. She's all excited. On Valentine's Day, her husband comes home and hands her a package. It's rectangular, kind of square. She opens it, and it's a book. And it says, what your dreams mean. <laughs> <laughs> disappointments, right? We all suffer disappointments. We all suffer shattered dreams. And storms will come. The question is, will we be dependent on God or will we be fearful of what's happening? It's hard not to be, but I will show you that the, the choice is to be in awe of God and dependent on Him. Now, how did the disciples respond? It says here, they, they, they said... They were scared. It says they had a great fear. You don't even care that we're dying? They were freaking out in our vernacular. They were discouraged. They were fearful. The reality of the situation is they forgot two things. One, Jesus said, we are going to the other side. We're going. If he says that, they don't need to worry that they're not going to get there because he's in the boat with them. They're going to the other side. Secondly, they forgot they were in the boat with God. <laughs> they were in the boat with God incarnate, and so they didn't need to worry. But their human side became very fearful. And we can do the same thing when we're going through a difficult time. Jesus was sleeping because he knew that God was in control. He had complete dependence, and he models for us that sweet sleep that we would all like to have when we lay down at night because we have nothing to worry about. Well, that's the way he slept because he had complete and utter dependence and trust in God. Jesus knew the storm was coming before he ever got in the boat because he knows everything. But he wasn't worried about it. And he slept because he knew God would have it, that God had it under control. God had promised, has promised us that he will be with us in the midst of our storms. In John 16, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Storms will come, but we're never alone. In 439, in verse 39, they wake up Jesus. They wake him up. And what does Jesus do? He stands up and immediately rebukes the storm. He rebukes the wind. And the storm stops. Now, I want you to think about violent storms and how they come and go. We had a lot of wind yesterday. This is kind of apropos. We had a lot of wind yesterday. Imagine being on a boat with, the, with water filling the boat with that kind of storm. Or worse. Storms usually die down gradually. But when Jesus stood up, he rebuked the wind and it stopped like that. Gone. Complete silence. It said there was an utter calm and silence that came over the physical world immediately. I want us to think about the power when he says, silence, be still, and it's over. He sternly warned the wind, and it stopped. He spoke that it would be muzzled, and boom, it was gone. That is the God that we serve. That is the Lord that we praise and thank. And that is the Jesus that we have in our lives. That's who we're dependent on. That kind of God with that kind of power. The problem is we have trouble believing it. But it's absolutely true. Matthew says the disciples were amazed in his account of this story. They were simply amazed and they, they were struck with wonder. It says that they actually became fearful because it scared them that they were in the boat with somebody who had power over the physical universe. Because, see, that's the God we serve. He's not only over the spiritual realm, he's over the physical realm. He controls it all. The only part of creation that has ever disobeyed God is mankind. <laughs> we disobey God. The waves and the wind and the trees, they will obey him. The flowers obey him. We don't. And he had two options. He could either do away with us, or he could die for us. And that's what he chose. 
He could either do away with us or die for us. And he chose to die for those who disobey him. So we can choose to follow him or not. We do have that choice. The power of the divine that we serve in, in the heaven, even though we can't see it, is one that controls everything in the physical universe because he made it. He created it and he controls every bit of it. There is no force that matches his we don't have to be concerned about it. We needn't be fearful of things in life because the one we pray to and the one that we serve has power over it. He's sovereign over it. And just as he stopped the wind and the storm like that, he has the power to do that if we have faith in him. The question is, which one are we afraid of? Are we afraid of our circumstances or we have a fear and an awe of the power over them? One or the other we're going to live by. It says the disciples were absolutely fearful that this Jesus was in the boat with them and had that kind of power. So they were more afraid of that than they were of the storm. So my question is, which one do you live by? You see, the, the human brain, we understand now that there's a part of the brain called the amygdala, this little part deep in our brain uh, it's, it's an instinctual part of our brain that responds to anxiety, to fear, and to anger. And, and it seems to light up on scans when we're angry or we're fearful or we're anxious. That part of the brain, that rudimentary part of the brain, that animal part of the brain lights up. But when we experience awe and, and spiritual things, the top part of our brain lights up which is the rational part of our brain, the thinking part of our brain, the governing part of our brain. And we actually have, our, our God made our brain this way, so we can either choose to be fearful about our circumstances and light up our amygdala, this animal part of our brain, that tends to cause aggression and anger and fear and anxiety, or we can have awe and spiritual uh, reverence for God which lights up the top part of our brain. The part of our brain that governs rational decisions, gives us peace, gives us joy, and allows us to sleep even when the storm's going on. That's been shown to be true just from PET scans. And I believe that our brain is wired that way on purpose. So I think we need to depend on God and have an awe for God rather than a fear of what's going to happen in life. And we'll see that our, our, we will have a peace that will pass all understanding and we will have that blessed assurance that we sang about. Unlike the wind and the waves, you're free to choose whether or not you will follow Jesus, you will live in awe, or you will live in fear. You have that choice. Jesus will, will allow you that. But ultimately, if you put your faith in Jesus, if you live in faith, in the faith of God, a strong faith of God, not in fear of worldly circumstances, if you do, you can know that Jesus is in control of everything, uh, both the heavenly realm and the, the physical realm. Uh, he touches your life in many different ways that you don't even see. He probably protects you from things you don't know about. And you can relax and live in peace depending on him to calm your storms. Keith, if you would come forward and go ahead, and we're going to close in a song. And the altar is open to either pray for the children or pray for a need that you have or to ask God to help you be dependent, which is not natural to us, on him rather than be fearful of what's going to happen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, uh, we know that you are our loving Father, that you're full of grace, abounding, that you're a merciful God, but also you have great power, scary power, power that, that, we don't even, that we don't understand. How can it be that somebody can stand up in a boat and clap his hands and snap his fingers and the water stops? I, it's an amazing feat. And that's just one of many, many things that you did to prove your power. God, we are either going to live in fear of what's going to happen or we're going to live in awe 
and reverence of who controls the world, one or the other. If we choose the latter, we live in peace. We, we live with joy. We live with an assurance. We live with confidence. Like the coach who said, we, we're going to win next year. That's an assurance based on trust. I pray, God, that we have that kind of trust, and I pray that we have the kind of dependence like Joni Erickson taught. I, even though, no, we haven't suffered the things she suffered, thank you. But we can still have that sweet dependence and that sweet union with you. God, I pray we, we, we ask for that today. That if we're not living that way, if we don't have that in our life, that we seek it, we find out how to get it, and we develop that kind of spiritual awe and, and reverence in our relationship with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.